How many of you believe the day is coming when you will have to get here very early to find a seat? I've already asked Renee to get a reserved seat for me. <laughs> but believe for great things to really happen in our lives. Do you really believe that today? I want to read something before I get into what I want to say, that a prominent soul winner made a statement, and this is what he said. Let the cross be raised again in the center of the marketplace, as well as on the steeple of the church. Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves. On a town heap at the crossroads, so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The Son of God was crucified at the kind of place where cynics talk smut, where thieves cursed, and soldiers gambled, because that is where Christ died, and since that is what he died about, that is where Christians can best share his message and love, because that is where real Christianity is all about. Amen? It was interesting when the revival started in Madang many years, or 50 years ago, that the Lord led us to go down to the marketplace, down to the markets, and begin a witness in a religious town. And after a few weeks, the town council had an urgent meeting to ban uh, this Jesus people, <laughs> gospel people from going into the marketplace. But isn't God wonderful how he knows things in advance? And he didn't lead us inside the marketplace. He led us outside the marketplace between the market and a graveyard. <laughs> and they made that statement, you can't do open air or church work in the market because that's our private property. We said, sorry, we are outside of the marketplace, but we're alongside it. And that's where the gospel initially was declared and preached in that town, religious town of Madang, where evangelical missionaries had gone there in past years and were run out of town by the government, by the local government, actually run the people out of town. But you know, God has a way to penetrate the powers of darkness and bring the gospel to a needy people. A people who were not heathen as we would know a heathen, but they were religious dead. They had a religion but did not know the power or the, the authority or the name of Jesus. And they were waiting for a message to be declared to bring the power of gospel to them. And later on, I remember on a uh, particular Monday night, we, we got a call saying that, there was a preacher who preached in my brother's church here at Calvary Chapel. Uh, he heard about what was going on in Madang, and he wanted to come to Madang. He was a Jordanian preacher out of Elam Bible Institute in America. His name was Budget Batazi. And can you imagine a preacher with a name like that? Budget Batazi. <laughs> and I thought, that doesn't sound like an American name, but he was Jordanian. And he got up, and he... he had this meeting on a Monday night, so I made an announcement to the congregation, we're having church on Monday night. They all yelled back, no problem, pastor. And there was 500 people there on a Monday night. Can you imagine? The whole church was there. And he got up and he said, I'm Jordanian. I was baptized in the Jordan River. Man, people come alive. They thought, oh, there is a Jordan River somewhere. And uh, they were alive. And he preached for an hour. And when the altar call was made, the first ones at the altar were all the pastors of the church and various churches. 
were on their faces at the altar. And God began to move. The second night, are you listening? There was a thousand people there because those people went and told their neighbors. Stuart went and told their neighbors, said, better, better come over to Gospel Lighthouse. Your life will be changed. That same man came back a year later and preached for five nights on Noah's Ark. Can you imagine? Preached five nights on Noah's Ark and 600 people got saved in five days. We baptized 350 people the following Sunday morning. Woo! Aren't you excited? Hey, that can happen anywhere when God moves. When God moves. Are we expecting God to move? And, and, and down on the marketplace, I remember one time, uh, a great preacher by the name of Arthur Blessed, some of you may know that name, he come to Madang and wanted to spend a, a week with us and he marched from down up the highway down the road and certain people met him of religious faith and leadership and told him to get out of town or we'll kill him and, uh, or get, and he said, sorry, I'm here already, I'm willing to die for Jesus. He made it to town and when he got to town, uh, I invited him to get out in the marketplace and preach. He preached for 15 minutes or so and there was something like 40 or 50 people kneeling down in the dirt in the edge of the marketplace giving their hearts to Jesus. Hallelujah. Do you long to see that? Oh, I said, so. do you long to see that? Yeah, we long. What about the middle? Do we long to see that today? Can it happen here? Do we want to see it happen here? And I believe that we are on the verge of something great. A friend of ours, Teal Osborne, Pastor Miles used to work for him years ago. <laughs> Teal Osborne said that it's a shame that within 400 years, by the fourth century, the church was established with a steeple on the, on the, on the uh, established church, but the people had lost their love and their power for Jesus. They call it the Dark Ages where the church has just survived, just survived. But it wasn't until, like the Wesley brothers, that revival come. Sing, songs were written. The power of personal evangelism began to start working. And I, I just feel motivated today after Pastor uh, Carrot, uh, Herit, Carrot, Carrot, or whatever, uh, mentioned a few weeks ago that the world is, is, is in need for a fresh awakening. Can you agree with that? A fresh awakening. Now, I remember one of the um, government governors uh, in Medang. He, he, was, he was okay, but uh, he took me up to a village church that had been burnt down. And they said, we don't want gospel here. And he said, I, I didn't come for that reason. He said, I come for the reason that these people have a right to declare the gospel message. He was a devout Catholic man. And a few, many years later, we went back to the Medang for a, a part, and a, it was a men's meeting. And we had it in the United Church just to be, you know, um, share the faith in that, and they were happy. And this guy had come walking across the grass with a little a little bill him over, a little grass bag over his shoulder. And he walked up to me and he said, do you know me? And I said, Gabriel Buanam. He said, yes. He said, I'm one of you now. <laughs> he said, I'm one of you now. I said, really? What happened? He said, I went to a little local church up the road and gave my heart to Jesus, been baptized. And he said, now I'm a believer. He was one of the government officers that had to say to a group of people that wanted to to kill us and destroy the gospel lighthouse and the Christian faith. And he had to say, get out of my office. He said, I'll throw the whole lot of you in prison. <laughs> Why? Because God was working in his darkened heart at that time of a day when he can say, I'm one of you now. Woo! How many of you would be excited when your neighbor after they see the grace of God in your life, they say, I believe I'm one of you now. I want to come with you. I want to be part of what you're a part of. So evangelism, revival, it may begin in the church with people. 
but it goes out to touch the world. Touch the world. My wife was preaching in a church in Rabaul, and there was about a thousand people there. And was, the service was really moving by the Spirit. And when she finished preaching, she said, there's a gang here. This may be your last chance to give your life to Jesus. And the pastor there leaned over to me and he said, Pastor, he said, there's no gang here. He said, these are all believers. He forgot that half the congregation were outside, couldn't get into the building. And I said, well, Joe, Pastor Joe, if it's God, it'll happen. If it's not God, okay, missed it. And Pastor Iron said again, there's a gang here. This is maybe your last chance to find peace with God. And out of the darkness walked in five or six guys with hoodies on and caps over their head down there. And he turned to me and said, they are the worst gang in the eastern province. He said, the police are trying to arrest them. And here they are kneeling at the altar, giving their hearts to Jesus. Woo! Come on, someone shout hallelujah. And after the meetings, people come up to us. They said, we couldn't get into the building, but we're outside. And they said, there are angels dancing on the roof of the church. Angels dancing on the roof of the church. You say, I don't believe it. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> angels dancing on the roof of the church. And half the through uh, Pastor Irene's sermon, or she just started, uh, these pastors tapped me on the shoulder and said, look over there. I said, what? They said, Jesus is standing there. And I said, oh, I can't see him. <laughs> and they said, yes, he is. He's standing there with his hands under his chin like this, just looking around. I said there was a thousand people, about four times as big as this church, the building was. And halfway through, Pastor Irene's preaching. She's preaching away, she's, and she said something like that. Yes, I will. Yeah, I will tell them. And I thought, that's nothing to do with what she's talking about. It, it's something that... You know, she lost the lines or something. And afterwards she said, no, she said, Jesus walked up beside her and stood behind her and told her to declare something. And she just, she just answered him and said, yes, I'll tell them that. <laughs> Amazing. Isn't that wonderful? When you and I can come into the house of God and we never know what's going to happen. <clears throat> they used to make that statement in Madang. Is that right, Linda? We never know what's going to happen in church. And we'd say, we don't either. Sometimes Pastor Irene had come into church and she said, I don't want any worship this morning. I just want to preach. <clears throat> All right. And people would come to church and say, what's going on here? We generally have a half an hour singing before the preacher. You know, when God moves, people move too with God. True? Thank you, Stuart, for coming out. All right. In my early days, I grew up in a family that were born again or come into the Pentecostal experience, and I was only very young. My dad and mum were very, very committed Salvation Army people. They wouldn't say, God bless the Salvation Army. You can buy good secondhand clothes there. <coughs> All right. And, um, and they were in there, but every Sunday... After service, they would put their trombone and that in the, in the cupboard and they would, as quick as they could, get around the corner to Macquarie Street in Parramatta because there was an evangelist there from Africa by the name of Van Acre who was preaching. And my mum and dad and a whole bunch of Salvation Army people had a hunger, hello, had a hunger to see the power of God. How hungry are we? True. How hungry are we today? And they'd get there, <clears throat> and my dad is sitting there, and this preacher was such anointed preacher that, it, and they had all sorts of people in the Astra Theater at the time, and some guy would be up there <clears throat> trying to uh, mess up the preaching or interrupt or something, and the preacher say, "I bind you in the name of Jesus, my God, please." And when the preacher had finished, they'd say, "Hey, pastor, what about the?" The guy, you bet, oh, I better let him go. He'd go, oh, so I release you in the name of Jesus. And the guy would run out of the building. But, 
the, the, these, these are fellas like newspaper reporters and things like that. The power of God. And I used to sit there and my dad and mum would tell me about these things. And I'd sit there and say, wow, wow. And I remember as a young fellow, I went with my parents up to Cessnock. Anyone heard of Cessnock? This Van Eyck fellow went to Cessnock and six weeks, 600 people, radical unionists got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now ready, <laughs> you listening? Now ready to murder the premier. And this guy goes in there and he preaches and 600 get saved. So I went up there with my parents uh, uh, some years later and they were having an open air meeting, not a church service, an open air meeting whereabouts in front of the pub. And I thought, hmm, never heard of a church service in front of a pub before. So I went there, stood there, and all the drunks were coming out. And if they tried to disturb, there were big preachers like Michael, like Michael there, and you know, strong men. Like, he'd just pick them up and carry them out of the ring and dump them over on the side of the curb somewhere. But people, other people would come out of the pub straight into the ring, fall on their knees and get saved. And I thought, wow, what a place to preach the gospel. What a place to declare the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I grew up with that. But I also grew up with great persecution. Go to school and they say, what's your religion? I say, oh, I'm four square. Four who? Oh, you make the tobacco. Uh, you, uh, you've, got the, you, you've got the grocery store. I said, no, I'm only about nine or ten. You know, oh, you got the tobacco company? No. You, you got the groceries, the four square groceries? No. Well, what, what's four square? I say, Penny, Penny who? Never heard of that. Who are? So I, I would say, oh, we're a crossbreed between Salvation Army and Baptist. Oh, all right then. We'll write, write that down. Cross between Salvation Army and Baptist. The persecution was unreal. Never had our own church buildings. Never had a church that you can even put a, had a smelly, Masonic Hall that we'd go in that was, they had a uh, drinking party the night before, so you had church with the smell of alcohol. That was my my early days of being brought up. Uh, and uh, uh, no church building, noisy. Main message was Jesus is coming soon. Well, that was good. Well, Jesus is coming soon. The other one, we're coming out of the promised land. Oh, into the promised land, coming out of Egypt. And the pastor preached that every second Sunday. So that was the case. And that was it, the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But there was very little emphasis on revival, Jesus coming. How many of you, Jesus has come to you in salvation? Yeah, Jesus is in you, right? Yeah. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2. I'm going to watch the clock. To, oh, yeah, I see the clock here. Darkness covers the earth and the people. But the Lord shall arise and his glory shall be seen. Do you believe that scripture? Today, the Lord shall arise and his glory shall be seen. Chapter 2 in the book of Acts was the empowering of the Holy Spirit upon the early church. Great results. Great results. Could you imagine, uh, such as it was in Medang in the early days, I'm glad we've got three of our daughters here today. <laughs> they all grew up in this. Uh, in Medang, there's a teacher's college where young people come from all over Papua New Guinea to go and become school teachers. But God knew, God knew that those young people would not become just school teachers, they'd become lights and evangels to carry the message wherever they go because by the time they graduated, they were convinced, when I get into my classroom, I will begin a church. I will begin a fellowship. I will begin a meeting where people can come in a classroom. And so those people uh, in that uh, uh, teacher's college and Shadrach lives near that where that college is. Those young people come. They didn't know. They come and they thought Saturday night, woo, we're going to have a rock and roll dance because there is an assembly hall there. But 
they were invited to come to a youth meeting, young people. Come to a youth meeting and see maybe a film, Cross, um, what's it called? Eh? Like, yeah, it's Crossing the Switchblade. And they'd come along, and every month on that first Friday that those young people were in college, they were challenged with the gospel, and probably about 90 or 100 got saved the first, Friday, the first Saturday night of February every year. And they were baptized by Easter. They were all being baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. And those young people who were persecuted, <laughs> I can't believe this, they would go into the classrooms of a night and pray for hours. And the authorities would try and stop them. But the next night, they're over in another classroom. The next night, they're over in the, in the wash house somewhere. The other night, they're somewhere else. The, the authorities didn't know where they were because the Holy Spirit was leading them to pray and pray and pray and pray. Wonderful. And they'd, they'd come to us the next day. They'd say, oh, we had two angels last night. Oh, we had Jesus come to us last night. How would you feel if you went to bed tonight and during the night, Jesus visited you. Or you were sitting in your room just meditating on the Lord and an angel showed up. This was normal. When God moves, amazing things become normal. Woo! Are you still interested? <laughs> in Acts 3, uh, chapter 3 of Acts, it's just as powerful as Acts 2 because that's when the gospel went out of the upper room, went out of that enclosure, went out into the streets where thousands of people gave their hearts and lives to Jesus. Exciting. The Bible says in Acts chapter 3 and verse 20 and 21, it said, heaven must retain unto times of refreshing. Do you believe the world needs a refreshing? Do you believe Sydney needs a refreshing? Do you believe Blacktown needs a refreshing? Do you believe that we can be the light? Or oh, not can, we are the light that brings a refreshing to this town of Blacktown. Cosmopolitan? Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. That we can be that people to touch. Areas of res restoration in marriages where possible, in families, the local church, health and healing, spiritual leadership and authority. The more I talk to Pastor Paul, pray for him, he's trying to get home today. <laughs> I, I think they canceled the flight, but that's normal. Huh? May, you, you know what? The Lord could still have him show up at 5 o'clock here in Sydney. Supernatural. Transportation. How did Philip in the Bible get from one place to the other place? Huh? You tell me. A young pastor in, in New Guinea, Pastor Francis, he's spoken here at this pulpit. He said, oh, I went out to Long Island. I said, how did you get there? 80 miles away, oh, 80 kilometers away. And boats only go there, planes heart never go there. And he's, he said, I'll tell you one day. He never did tell me. How he got there, I don't know. <laughs> you say, I don't believe it. What? Why don't you believe it? All right. And so we need to realize that in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, it says, after two days, he will revive us. The Bible tells us that one day is as what? A thousand years. So we're in the third day. Got a good sermon on third day people. We won't talk about that today. We're in the third day. The church age will end in revival. True? Are you sure of that? Yeah, I am. It'll end in revival. There'll be a great, great, great move of God. Isaac, my son in up the back there, he may not sit next to his wife during church, not here at any rate, but he's from Indonesia. And I was reading a report where in Indonesia in the 70s, I believe, Isaac, there was something like a million people getting saved every year in that country. It was a great move of 
the Spirit of God in that country. You know, God can move in any country. He's not limited because of what their leaders say. <laughs> he can overrule that. He'll come, the Bible says, he will come to us like seasonal rains. We had rain a couple of days ago. Did you all enjoy the rain? Yeah, I don't think anyone said, oh, I just hate this rain. No, we love the rain because it fed the gardens. And the Bible says he will come to us like seasonal rains, like the latter rain and the former rains. And like I mentioned it before, some of us, uh, we grew up in days where there was great moves of God. And like in my case, my grandchildren today, your grandchildren, Enoch, my great-grandchildren, Never hear it. Never hear about what grandma and grandpa or great-grandma and great-grandpa or great-great-grandpa saw and witnessed when they were alive. Teal Osmond, the great preacher, as I mentioned, he said less than one generation can pass and a church can lose the power of God in its congregation. Or a generation can lose the power of God within one generation. That's why I, I sang that song this morning. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. True? Revive us again. Stir us up again. David, even if you're over 80. Ray, even if you're well over 80. God can still stir us up. How are you feeling, Pastor Graham? That I, well, you know, I'm, no, 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 no. I'm longing, I'm longing, I'm longing to see a mighty revival hit this church just to blow us apart and say, wow, God can do it again. There's a, a plaque somewhere, probably wrapped up in a cupboard somewhere that says, it can happen here again something. And we need to believe that. We need to believe that. There, there was a, um, I remember one guy was leaning upside the telegraph pole outside the church. And uh, I said, oh, that so-and-so was out there. They said, oh, he'll get saved next week. Sure enough, he'll saved next week. And s still serving God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit draws them to people who are alive. Hello? People are alive. What's the problem with the church today? Well, it's dead, and it, in many cases, stinks of death. But when it's alive, guy two doors up, he said, you know, I used to come to Sunday school here years ago. In the 70s, he said, he, and he told me who, who it was, but he said, I always observe you people, you come out of church looking happy. Hey, they're watching. He said, but some people watch, some people come out of church and they look so miserable, they realize I just wasted two hours of my Sunday morning and the preacher stole 10% of my income for the week. Well, I want us to realize that Jesus is in us, is he? He's in us. You know, some, some good, good Christian uh, witnesses, they say, give your heart to Jesus, then you, then you just got to look to Jesus all the time. And so I, I would watch some of these people, and they're walking around like this area. I said, what are you looking at? I'm trying to find Jesus. No, 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 he's in you. Christ in us, the hope of glory. But then in, in um, Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, he said, he is coming to us. He's coming to us. Then later on, he'll come for us, and then we'll come to him. I must hurry here. Farmers, they know the right season to plant and the right season to harvest. I have a good friend up in Lithgow, Pastor Gary Abberton, and he ring me on the phone. He says, how's your garden? I said, great. Yeah, yeah, tomatoes are good. Spinach are good. Yeah, yeah, good, good. And uh, sometimes you ring up and you say, how's your garden? I said, Man, nothing. It's all dead. No, he said, ah. I said, oh, I just planted some seedlings. He said, ah, oh, pastor, wrong season. 
I said, what do you mean wrong season? You don't plant them in June or you plant them in September, October. Oh, okay then. So whenever I want to plant something, I ring Pastor Gary, is it right time to plant? He said, yeah, it's right time down there. It's a bit early for us up here in Lithgow. I said, thank you, Gary. I'll ring you back how we go. Why? Because there is a season. True? Wave your hand if you believe we're heading into a season when God wants to move by his Holy Spirit. Come on. Can I see more hands than that? God is wanting to do something fresh. And we know that God's work will be a seasonal work. Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2, it says, Revive thy work in the midst of the years. Remember mercy because prayer will bring the presence of God. What's the point of praying, coming to a prayer meeting, going to a prayer meeting or having a prayer meeting if we don't expect God to answer prayer and move? True? So that should be the focus that we believe that he will come to this church, to this city, to this nation. There's another scripture says if we put away the pointing of the finger, the gossip, something that we feel is not right. Someone says, I'm, I'm going to go to another church. The moment you go to another church, if your heart is not right, that church doesn't become right because you took your problem there. Let's get our hearts right and believe God to do something great. Uh, hallelujah. The church, the New Testament church was not a moral majority. It was a holy minority. True? Fashion as against passion. I traveled to America in 1957 with my mother to attend my brother's wedding. And at the dining room table that had the big bowls of fruit, those people, you people have been on a boat, a great big bowl of fruit. And then they have these little black, round black things. And the Americans would say, what's that? I said, passion fruit. Oh, never seen that before, Michael. Never seen passion fruit. What is it? I said, if you eat enough of it, you get real good passion. Oh, we'll eat that and that and that and take this and eat, swallow all these passions. I never did ask them what the result was, but, but I just told them, I said, you eat a lot of that and you, that's why it's called passion fruit. You get passion if you, and they'd, uh, they'd gobble them all down, take them off the fruit bowl and eat them. Uh, I don't know what happened, but never mind, that's, that's beside the point. But uh, we must realize in Judges, it says, the people served the Lord all the days of the elders who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Mothers and fathers, your children have a right to see the mighty works of God. Your, children, your grandchildren have a right to see the miracles of God. True? They have a right to see it. Your great-grandchildren have a right to see the mighty move of God. But the church today generally is pathetic, not prophetic. It's superficial, not supernatural. I remember in Medellin, I used to say, don't go to that church. Boy, boy, it'll grab you. It'll get you. Those people, da, 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 da. No, it was nothing to do with people. It was the power of God to change lives. One guy, he wasn't a very good guy. And um, he used to bash up people, get drunk and beat the living day, daylights out of people. His name was Casper. And, uh, and um, he, he got drunk and went to, went to court. And the judge said, come back Monday. He said, I'm going to put you in prison for a long time. He said, I'm tired of seeing you in my courtroom. And Monday, Saturday, he come to a meeting, a youth meeting. Hello, Chico? A youth meeting of all things. He's a married man. Come to a youth meeting. Gave his heart to Jesus. Got born again. Went back to the court on Monday. And the judge said, ah, you again. Yeah. Are you ready for sentencing? He said, yes, judge. I just want to say a few words to you. He said, go ahead. Hurry up. And he stood there. He said, judge. He said, you know what? Last Friday I was a sinner. 
But now, this Friday, uh, this Monday, I'm a saint. The judge said, what are you talking about? He said, last Saturday night, he, he said, I went up the road to gospel. And he said, I got born again. He said, I'm a new person. And he said, it's not good for Christians to go to prison. So I would ask you for, to change your mind. Just give me a monetary fine. And he said, I, you will never see me in this courtroom again. The judge fined him $30 or 30 kina. Casper never went back there again. I have down here, this is for Isaac's benefit. In the 1970s, Isaac, thousands of Muslims were getting saved every week in Indonesia in the 1970s. Thousands, thousands of Muslims were getting saved every week. All right. What happened to the children of Israel during the time of the judges? I'm nearly ready to finish. Godly leadership should worship God, Israel. Some years past, the nation turned into idolatry. Then they become enslaved by enemies. Then they cried out to God, and God sent another deliverer. That was the normal process of the Israelites. Didn't know what it was to live in victory every day of their life. But we realize the problem was in Judges chapter 2 and verse 8 and 10, it says Joshua died and a new generation arose that did not know the Lord. Did not know the Lord. How concerned are you and I that our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren know the Lord, know the Lord. Not whether they become doctors and lawyers, but do they know the Lord? The most important thing they need to know. And so we realize that also in the book of um, Hosea, I believe it is, it talks about certain caterpillars and grubs that devoured the vines of the Israelites. And I don't want to get into that. We don't have time for that. But the Bible says that the Lord is coming and great joy will be upon his people. Great joy upon his people. True revival, I'll close with this, cannot be organized. Hello? You say, weren't you organized in Benin? Oh, you organized to have church, organized to... What time for church? What time do you finish? <laughs> uh, ne ne never organized finish time. Dr. T. L. Osmond come for graduation one year and the service went for three hours long. <laughs> he was so excited, he said, at least we're not con controlled by time. But in case you don't know, it's 11.31. All right. Now, people like Deborah's got to get on the plane and so forth, but it's 11.31. Cannot be organized. True revival cannot be organized. Of course, the wind blows where it listed. Cannot be subsidized. Does not need financial backing. If you musicians can come up on the platform. Cannot be advertised. Nothing needed except a fire. Hello? Nothing needed except the fire. Cannot be computerized. God alone knows the extent of his power. Cannot be regularized. There is no theological track to run on. <laughs> True? Some of the great theologians have lived their life and missed revival. Great theologians have missed their revival through the years. Cannot be rationalized. It's a divine mystery. True? Divine mystery. It's beyond comprehension. <clears throat> it's hard for you and I to understand. Why would God send revival to a little red brick church on the corner of Morton Carter Street that someone figured... It was some sort of a factory or something. Why would God send a revival to a 
a church we don't even have a steeple on the roof, so God help us, oh Lord. Why? Because it's beyond comprehension. And lastly, cannot be denominationalized. That's a big word. In other words, it leaps over doctrinal barriers. <clears throat> the local Baptist pastor in Medang, he just come to a men's meeting. And he said to me, he said, Pastor, can you come and preach in my church next Sunday? I said, uh, okay. You know, I didn't want to sort of act like, he said, he said, we need the power in our church. So I went down there and preached the best sermon I could preach and not to be Pentecostal, you know, just normal. And he got up after the service and said, now, Pastor, we're going to open these altars and going to ha invite the whole church to come forward to receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. And I thought, wow, we're in a Baptist church? And he said, yep. He said, we need it. And those people come forward and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Baptist church. Cannot be den denominationalized when the wind blows. It just goes. So, Grace, what about the Baptist church up in the other corner? It can receive a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then if we don't move, can we all stand up? If we don't move, if we're not willing to move, and we, we want to hang on to some Pentecostal tradition that we've had, let me tell you, folks, we'll lose it. We'll lose it. We'll lose it. True? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will send revival in our midst. Not only for our sake, but for our children, for our grandchildren, for the youth of this church, for those of our neighbors, dear Lord, that they would receive something of the fire of the Holy Spirit that's burning inside of our hearts and lives. Lord, I just pray this in Jesus' name.